Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, good to be with all of you this morning. Hey, um, you know, this little summer mini series, we wanted to kind of have it be feel like that that was kind of like the, the spoiler alert of all the different titles of the summer mini series that's going to be coming as we uh, cover the book of 1 Samuel. But here's what we know we wanted to create something this summer that you could engage with the Bible personally on your own beyond the weekends. So we created a little devotional tool for you to go along with this mini-series that we're going to be doing, uh, and, and it's simply right here. You can pick up one on the way out today. We obviously can't cover all 31 chapters of the book of 1 Samuel, so what we did is during your summer, throughout the summer, you can take a look at all 31 books, one per day. So you can do that together, and I would say this, from personal experience, and then I also know this from research that the number one way that you can grow in your faith is by you personally engaging with the Bible. Research shows that. If you wanna grow in your faith, the number one way to do that is to read the scriptures. So I would love for each of you to go out here right in the center of the lobby after service and pick up one of those First Samuel books. And I'll just say this, one parent to another parent. If you want to grow together as a family this summer, this tool is designed for you to maybe with your family, each of you grabbing one and then coming together and comparing notes of what God might be teaching each of you over the dinner table or something like that. A great way for families to grow in their faith together. So everybody go out and pick up one on the way out today as we get ready to kick off this year's book of the Bible, 1 Samuel, okay? Today we start, well, we don't start. We're in the second part of a series entitled No Strings Attached. And, and this being Memorial Day weekend, being that this is a series about serving, I wanted to stop right here and just be able to acknowledge the loved ones that many of us have lost due to them laying down their lives, paying the ultimate sacrifice for us to be able to live in this great country, to enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy, the men and women, our family and friends who've lost their lives to protect that freedom. I know that there are many of you in our church that you know, you're dealing with Memorial Day a little bit differently than some because you have a memory of somebody dying to protect that freedom. But then I also know that there are many in our church, friends and family who are currently serving right now, and we also wanna pray for them as they're in harm's way today so that we can actually be here, think about that. Be here open, publicly worshiping Jesus and not have to worry about that, any persecution in that way. So I'd love to pray for those who are struggling tomorrow, those who are in harm's way tomorrow on this Memorial Day weekend. So let's pray together, okay? God, thank you that you are the one who gives us ultimate freedom, freedom that we could never experience even in this country. But God, you give us freedom in Christ from our sins. So God, we come to you and we pray to the all-powerful because we recognize that you are the only one who in this moment as we come to Memorial Day can comfort the families who have lost loved ones, who've paid that sacrifice, who've laid down their lives for us. And so God, I pray that you would come alongside the friends and the family who have lost those loved ones. And I pray that you would bring comfort and peace in a way that only you can. And God, right now, even though it's Memorial Day, we pray for those who are serving right now, our country, our, our wives and our daughters and our sons and our husbands and everything. God, we pray for these men and women who are in harm's way right now. God, I pray that you would protect them. Protect them from the evil one. Protect them from isolation. Protect them, Lord, from just harm. God, we ask that you would bring them home safe to us. God, on this Memorial Day weekend, we are grateful for those men and women who are sacrificially laying down their lives so that we can have the freedom that we enjoy in this country. It's in Jesus' name that we pray for them. Amen. So happy Memorial Day, everybody.
Would you open up your Bibles with me to John 13 today? We are in this series and we're going to take a look at Jesus giving his disciples a real-time illustration. He leverages this incredible moment where he sees a teachable moment and he literally does something. That Get this picture, okay? Here's Jesus at dinner with his disciples. And he is arguably the most powerful, most influential man that has ever walked the face of the earth. And we definitely know that he's the most powerful, influential man in this room at dinner with them. And this guy gets up. Jesus said this about himself. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that Jesus does this. John 13. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and he was going back to God, he rose from supper. How many of you still call it supper today? Most of us call it dinner, right? So he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist and then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Now, when I read this passage, being a dad of uh, daughters, we, you know, when they were little, we used to watch this movie, and this is what I think of when I read this passage, this movie, Penguins of Madagascar, anybody? Where King Julian, do you remember this character? He would say, don't touch the feet, all right? Don't touch the feet, anybody? Okay, see, when I read this passage, I think about this because to me, feet are nasty. I mean, just straight, even I think my own feet are, are nasty. But when you think about the disciples and what their feet would have been through at this dinner, think about in their time of history what they would have walked through on the dirty, nasty, dusty roads, all right? Think about that, what they would have stepped in with open-toed sandals, all right, with sharing the roads with cattle, horses, all kinds of animals. Think about what they would step in. Their feet at this dinner are straight up nasty, and Jesus... The most powerful man in the room, the most influential, he's the rabbi, he's the teacher, he steps up because he notices their nasty feet. And he takes it upon himself to leverage an incredible moment. He gets down on his hands and knees and he washes the disciples' feet. And then after this, he leverages this to teach everybody in the room a spiritual principle. Look at what he says here. Verse 12, when he had washed their feet, he put on his outer garments and resumed his place. And he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. Well, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than anyone who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So you need to know this culturally at this point. The act of washing a person's feet was a sign of hospitality to your guests. Because of all the things that were coming in from the outside into that dinner table, that that this was a sign for the lowest member of the household, the lowest servant of the household, in humility to do this job. But here we have Jesus, the most powerful man, who says, blessed are you if you do this. See, knowing this was not enough for Jesus. Doing it was what he was after for his disciples. And this is what I love about Jesus. He never asks us to do anything. He never asks his disciples to do anything that he hasn't done himself. Now, I want to be clear here today. I don't think Jesus is actually talking about washing feet. Right? I don't think he's talking about us going to the places where we live, work, and play, you know, with a basin of water and a washcloth, chasing people around saying, come here, man, take your shoes off. You know, I want to wash your little piggy toes. That's not what he's talking about. All right? What Jesus is doing here is he's taking a powerful, cultural, real-time illustration, and he's leveraging it to drive home a massive point that he's been trying to teach his disciples about being loving servants to all people, 
See, we talked about this last weekend in part one of this series. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You're also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. See, for Jesus, we've got to understand that loving people well was connected to serving people well. Even to the point of laying down his life for all people, Jesus did this. Mark wrote this, he said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And later on then, the Apostle Paul picks up on this idea of servanthood when he writes this incredible passage in Philippians 2. Listen to these words. So if there's any encouragement in Christ... If any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, by being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul says, have that kind of mind among yourselves. Have that same kind of love that Jesus had for us. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. These are one-liners from Paul that challenge me in the way that I live my life. And he challenges all followers of Jesus of how we should live our lives as we follow in Jesus' footsteps. Now, let me try to be clear here this morning, okay? Because it seems like there might be a little bit of a bait and switch going on here with Jesus. Because we hear that he served us flawlessly, no strings attached, but then we have to do these kind of things. So let me try to be clear here this morning. Jesus died for the salvation of all people, no strings attached. Okay, let's be clear. He laid down his life for you, Regardless of ever you believing in him or not, it's true. But God's hope, his desire is that all people would be saved by believing in and following his son Jesus. But be clear, God did not do this to get you to do something for him. He did this no strings attached. See, God gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross to reconcile you back to himself. Why? Because he loves you. And he wants a relationship with you, period. And when we recognize what he has has saved us from and what he wants to save us for, our only possible correct response is I don't deserve that. I am not worthy of love like that. How could I ever repay you, God, for loving me like that? And friends, I'm here to tell you that you can never repay God for saving you. His salvation is a free gift, no strings attached. And all you have to do is receive that. By believing in and confessing that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that he rose from the grave. And then you can enter into this eternal life-giving relationship with God. And when I did this as a freshman in college, I'll tell you, when I recognized what God had saved me from and what he was saving me for, my response was one of gratitude and affection. And I wanted to genuinely respond to God and what he had done for me. I wanted to live my life in such a way that was worthy of the life that God had sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die for so that I could live. 
And I wanted to genuinely spawn and spend the rest of my life serving God. Not because I had to, but because I wanted to. Not because I was obligated, but I was compelled to do that, to respond to that kind of love. See, friends, in our response to what Jesus has done for us, we should gladly follow his command to serve other people so that they in turn can also experience that saving love. See, because Jesus saved us and he put us back into a right relationship with God, we should be compelled to respond in a love and in a sacrificial serving, no strings attached, so that people can experience the same thing that we did. It makes sense to me. See, what Jesus and what Paul are urging those who follow Jesus is this. As Christians, our lives should reflect the one who laid down his life for us so that other people can experience that same thing. So today, with the remainder of my time, I want to try to convince us of just how valuable serving is. And I wanted to simply submit to you today what I've been calling around here a theology of serving. And, and that sounds like all intellectual and intimidating, but come on, it's me. You know, look who's teaching up here, all right? We're going to be able to get this today. And if you've been in any setting with me over the last few months, you've already heard this teaching because this is so important to me. So in the wider community now, I wanted to bring this. I've been teaching it in leadership trainings, you know, serving trainings, and now here today, because here's why. I believe that the church has to get this right. It's so important that we get this right. Because if we don't, you and I have the potential to greatly damage Jesus' reputation. And I don't want to do that to you. We could also damage the reputation of his church. And I know that you won't want to do that. So with John 13, that passage in Philippians 2 that I just read, as the major backdrop to this theology of serving, I want to define servanthood for us today. So what does this look like for you and me? If you hear nothing else, here's the main point of the message today. Servanthood is laying my life down for others. That's what it means. See, the heart of a servant of Jesus Christ is to be available to God and his purposes for our lives. And that will always include serving other people, no strings attached. See, Jesus modeled this for us. He came to us as a servant. Remember, he didn't come to be served. He came to serve us. So we too, as we follow him, see, our first response should be just like Jesus, who when he saw a need, he got up and he put on the towel and he started serving and addressing that need. That should be our first response as well. But I recognize that this is tough in a very me-centered country where we live in where it's all about you and me putting in the hard work to achieve the American dream for me and for my family. But listen, as a servant of Jesus Christ, we need to live counterculturally to serve God and other people before our own needs are met. Paul said to consider others more significant than ourselves. He said, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So this bears the question, is it a bad thing to look after your own interests? No, it's not. But it can become a bad thing when your universe only swirls around you and you're working only for you. See, Paul teaches us a sacrificial way of living that serves people, that serves God before we serve ourselves. So the next few points, I wanna get very practical with us today of what does this look like in our lives today? So if you're taking notes with me, the first one is this, servants of Jesus relinquish their rights to serve God and others. 
So I'm going to go through several categories of what this could look like in your and my life. So um, when we follow Jesus and we choose to follow him, if you're a part of a family here today, servants of Jesus surrender their rights to their family. See, catch this. If each and every one of us understood that it was our role in the family to serve the other people first, wouldn't things go a lot better in our households? See, these are the ways of God, and his ways are better than ours. It would go so much better if we did that. Let me just speak to married people in the room today. If you're married, a servant of Jesus who is married surrenders their rights to singleness and everything that comes with that lifestyle. You're married now. You're not allowed to do that anymore. Relinquish that right. Let me speak to the single people in the room today. If you're a servant of Jesus and you are single, you surrender your rights to marriage and everything that comes with that. Let me explain. See, there are certain things that only married people have the right to do according to God, and you're not allowed to do them. So lay that down. Surrender that. In this great country that we all love to be a part of with so many freedoms that we enjoy, servants of Jesus Christ surrender their rights even to their freedom, to their finances, to their possessions. We even surrender our rights to our own reputation. Why? Because we're more concerned with Jesus' reputation than we are with ours. This is how it works when you're a servant of Jesus. See, servants of Jesus, they even surrender their rights to their time. It's not me time. It's God, what do you want me to do with your time that you've given to me? See, we surrender our rights even to our nationality because we are citizens of a higher kingdom. Servants of Jesus surrender their rights to their opinions and their need to be right. Servants of Jesus even surrender, they relinquish their rights to their future. Why? Because God has it in his hands. He knows you and loves you. And here's why we do all of this. Because the apostle Paul points out whatever rights we don't relinquish to God can subtly begin to drive our lives, even to the point of mastering us. And we might not even know it. That's why he wrote this in 1 Corinthians, all things are lawful for me as a Christian, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me. I'm allowed to do anything, but I will not be dominated by anything. See, as servants of Jesus, we don't abuse our freedom that comes with being in Christ to do whatever it is that we want and then ask for forgiveness later. No, that's not how we roll. See, we relinquish our rights to serve God and others before we serve ourselves. No strings attached. The second thing, if you're taking notes, right out of John 13 and Philippians 2, is that servants walk in humility. Servants of Jesus, because he did this for us, we do this for him and other people. He modeled this by washing the disciples' feet. He modeled this for us by going to the cross and dying for us. So what does this mean for you and me today? This is what it means, practically speaking, that we do not do things for man's approval. We do thing only for God's approval. Servants of Jesus don't seek to be noticed, but we're willing to serve in the hidden places. Servants are willing to serve no matter how messy the job. Servants of Jesus don't seek positions of leadership so that they can exercise power over people. No, we do it because we want to serve other people. Just like Jesus, no strings attached. See, as followers of Jesus, there is no serving opportunity that is beneath you and me. See, when I am hiring people to become on staff here at the church, I'm asking a ton of questions about humility. I want to get down to the character and the integrity of people who will serve you as a church. But then as a pastor here, I would expect that the elders... The ministry leaders, the members of this church, 
that they would be willing to serve in the lowest and in the dirtiest of all places, so to speak. Why? Because this is what Jesus did for us. So in response, we want to do the same thing. I think we all need to ask ourselves today, are we more important than Jesus that we don't think that we should take up the towel and serve other people? Think about that today. Because friends, when we all walk in humility together as a church, you realize that the mission of the church rapidly advances forward. Because we're all willing to do whatever it takes to advance the mission. And here in our context, this is what happens. That the Pittsburgh region is impacted with the hope of the gospel if and when we humble ourselves. And all get on board to do whatever it takes to move that forward. The third thing, if you're taking notes with me today, is servants of Jesus walk in obedience. Listen, not because we have to. Because we want to. We want to respond to what God has done for us. See, the evidence of a servant's love for Jesus is their obedience to him and what he says. And one of the best ways, see, we, if we were to walk in a godly way, with a godly attitude, always under the authority that we've been put under, one of the best ways that we could enhance Jesus' reputation at the places where we work is to be having always a good attitude. You know, to serve our coworkers and our boss, our coaches, even if they're a jerk to us. Remember that in this setting, Jesus washed Judas' feet, who betrayed him, was the one who got him arrested, eventually crucified. Jesus washed his feet. See, servants of Jesus are obedient to God even when they don't understand what God is doing because they trust him. They trust his character and ways. And servants are obedient to God even when it goes against what the world tells us we should be doing. See, many of us could get up here right now and you could share your story of how God's ways are much better than the way that you just tried See, if, if we could all just get this concept that God's ways are much better than our ways, we could spare ourselves a lot of pain in this life. If we could just get that. See, Jesus, servants of Jesus walk in obedience. The fourth thing, if you're taking notes with me today, is this. Servants of Jesus serve all people. All people. Anyone that God calls us to serve. Please hear this. Servants of Jesus serve people regardless of someone's background or nationality or the color of their skin. Christians serve regardless of someone's looks, their attitudes, their actions, or what they're wearing. Followers of Jesus serve regardless of how you may feel about other people and how others may feel about you. Servants of Jesus, they serve regardless of how other people treat them. Now, don't raise your hands on this, but I want to ask you a question. How many of you operate on a one-strike policy? Let me explain. So, in baseball, in softball, there's at least three strikes before a person is called out, right? But how many of you in your neighborhoods, you've had a neighbor offend you one time and you've never spoken to them again? How many of you at work, you've had a person cross you one time and you're done with them? I hate to say this out loud, but this is me sometimes. And man, I don't, I don't mean to do it. I don't want to do it. I, I really struggle against trying not to do it. But there's a tendency in me to be that guy with one strike and you're done. But as a follower of Jesus, I want to get better at that. I want to grow in that area. Why? Because it's not about my reputation. It's about Jesus' reputation. And if I've said that I'm a follower of Jesus and I'm a one-strike guy, that's not how Jesus does. So I want to get better at that. How about you? 
See, servants of Jesus serve all people, not just the people that we like. So the last thing for our time today is this. Servants of Jesus die to self and live for God. No strings attached. We die to our self-will to do God's will. We die to what it is that we want so that we can do what God wants us to do. We die to pleasing ourselves so that we can please God. And this is a tricky one, so let me try to be clear here. Servants of Jesus die to self-confidence. Okay, if it's just me, I can do all of this. If I just put in the hard work, I can make this happen for myself. And that might be true for you in certain settings, but followers of Jesus, they die to self-confidence and they put their confidence and trust in God who can empower you to do anything that you set your mind to. Not because you did, but because his power flowing through you can help you accomplish that. That's the difference. If we could all come to recognize who we are in Jesus Christ, we could realize a place of power and of fruition that we have never known before beyond our imagination. And I'm excited to tell you this. We, uh, as a teaching team, we're actually going to be doing a series in the fall that is going to deal with this issue of identity, of who we are in Christ. Because many of us, We are living from the lies that we've maybe learned as a kid, things that happened to us, things that we have done, and we're living in those lies, but that's not who God says we are. Our identity in Christ trumps all of that. And if we begin to live from those places of who we are in Christ, man, there's power there. And so we're going to do this series entitled Make Believe. Okay, these, these places where we think that we're really living, but it's just make-believe. We're not living from the places where God has told us we already are. So be watching out for that series entitled Make Believe. Another way that we all die to ourselves, so please hear this, is we die to our opinions and embrace God's ways as our opinions. Let me say that again. We need to die to our personal opinions and we need to embrace God's ways as our opinions. I love what John, the gospel writer, he puts it like this. He must increase. That's Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. See, if we all stopped sharing our personal opinions and started embracing God's ways, our communities could rally around and unite around God's love for all people. And as a servant of Jesus, we have the power to do that when we unite and embrace God's ways if we would just die to ourselves. How do I know this is possible? Because Jesus did this and he changed the world. So friends, to wrap this series down today, Jesus served us flawlessly with no strings attached, expecting nothing in return. He died so that we could truly live. And when we choose to serve him, by the way, he never forces us to do anything. When we choose to serve him, by expressing our gratitude by these things, by relinquishing our rights, by walking in humility, by walking in obedience, by serving all people, by dying to ourselves and living for God. Friends, when we do these things, our communities are gonna take notice. An entire region of Pittsburgh could be changed when we do these things. I believe it. I believe it. Do you? Why don't you stand up with me, everybody? I'd love to pray for us today. I want to remind you, our elders are always down front here, ready to pray with any of you today. And then pick up your uh, first Samuel guide on the way out, okay? Let me pray for us. God, thank you for sending Jesus for us so that we could have a model of how we could live our lives. God, as we walk out these doors today, I pray that we would be a people who serve with no strings attached. Help us with that, God, because it's not our natural tendency, but it's who you've called us to be. 
Help us to be a church that serves like that because Jesus served us like that. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.